Okay, hello and welcome back, and today we're going to continue with our discussion on differential equations. So thus far we've seen multiple ways of solving or assessing differential equations. We've seen separation of variables, we've seen slope fields, and we've seen Euler's method. Today we're going to see how differential equations are used in the real world, uh, particularly with growth and decay. So you can imagine that we can talk about the growth of populations or decay, think about like radioactive decay. We'll see some examples that use those. So this should be a very exciting lesson. Let's jump into it. So oftentimes the rate of change is proportional to our variable. So in this case, we'll talk about why. And we say that how quickly something changes is related to how much we have of it. That's one understanding of it. We use the vocabulary word directly related if the rate of change is equal to some multiplicative factor of y. So perhaps we have the differential equation of this form where k is some constant and dy dt is directly related to y because we have it equaling k times y. However, if we have k divided by y, so y is in the denominator, we call that indirectly related. So the rate of change is equal to some multiplicative factor of the inverse of y. k is something that we call the proportionality constant. So that kind of uh, tells us where, where we should be balanced at. And we can see that as y grows larger, the rate of change will increase if it's directly related, right? So if y increases, then we dy dt also goes up. Whereas if y changes here, then we have a larger denominator, which means dy dt will decrease. And remember, k is a constant, so that doesn't change. So these are just some things to be familiar with. So let's try to solve both of these differential equations. Uh, on the left and the right, we see the two different differential equations, and we'll solve them using uh, separation of variables. On the left, we get this equation here. And this is the equation that we'll be using the most. Uh, this can model both growth and decay. So particularly when k is greater than zero, we work with growth, um, and the converse holds true as well. And if k is less than zero, then we'll work with decay. On the right-hand side here, we have this kind of formula. But really, this is the formula we should be familiar with and know what value of k is associated with what. So with that said, let's try to do some problems and kind of figure out as we go along. So the first question is talking about the half-life of plutonium, uh, plutonium-239, and that is given to be 24,100 years. So how long will it take 10 grams of plutonium-239 to decay to 1 gram? So first, let's do a brief explanation of what half-life means, and then we can solve uh, this problem. So what half-life means is suppose we have, um, we'll pretend plutonium is some sort of solid like this, and we have 10 grams of it. As time goes along, uh, this plutonium will decay. So eventually we'll be left with a smaller blob. And let's say this is five grams. So this current uh, mass of plutonium is half the mass that we started with. So the time it takes to go from here to here, the time it takes for that de decay to occur, is 24,100 years. And then as time goes on a little bit further, and we're left with a smaller blob, let's say 2.5 grams, this is half of the previous value. So this would also take 24,100 years. So it takes 48,200 years to go from 10 grams to 2.5 grams. So this is what we mean by half-life. So let's say that in the beginning, uh, we have 10 grams of plutonium-239. So we'll say this is at t equals zero. And we want to figure out t equals what? So that way we have one gram. And we can see that, okay, if we continue this process, uh, next would be like, 1.25 grams, that would take another 24,100. Uh, so we're not quite at one gram, 
but so that means our answer should be larger than the sum of these three which is uh, 72,300. So if our answer is greater than this, then we know that we've done some things correctly. Okay, so we're talking about uh, decay in this case. So we'll use the formula y equals ce to the kt, bearing in mind that k can be negative. So at t equals zero, well, let's first discuss what these variables mean. So remember, c and k are constants. So we would have to solve for those uh, because right now we have an infinite amount of equations of the form y equals c to the kt. t is our variable for time. And we'll let y be the mass of plutonium. I'll call it plut 239. Uh, and y of t is the mass at time t. So that would be uh, the kind of notation we use. So with that notation, at time zero, we start with 10 grams. And, okay, we also know that its half-life is 24,100 years. So with that in mind, um, y of what will be equal to five? Well, that would be 24,100. I didn't give myself enough room to write that. Right, so after 24,100 years, our the output of the function should be 5. So these are sort of the uh, conditions that we have, and we want y of what equals 1. So we're solving for that question mark. Well, let's take these two conditions that we have here, plug them into our equation, and see if we can start to find some values for c and k. So y of 0 is equal to c e to the k times 0, because we're at t equals 0, and that's just equal to c, right? And well, we know that this is going to equal 10, because we're given that right here. So c is equal to 10, so we can modify our equation to be y equals 10 e to the k t. Cool. Let's work with the second condition now. So y of 24,100 is going to be, well, c is now equal to 10 times e to the 24,100 times t. And this we said equals 5. Well, right here we have an equation with just one unknown. So we can solve for t. Oh, sorry, not t. This should be k. We can solve for k, which is the other constant we're looking for. So if we divide by 10 on both sides, we get e to the 24,100k equals 1 half, and then take the natural log of both sides, and we're left with 24,100k equals the natural log of 1 half, and finally k equals the natural log of 1 half divided by 24,100. So really, our equation is now y equals 10e to the ln of 1 half over 24,100t. And we have an entire equation here, which means we can plug in any value of t and know how many grams of plutonium we have. And we'll say, you know, t is greater than zero. But what are we trying to find? We're trying to find what value of t gives, gives us a value of y equal to one. So let's put y equal to 1 and then solve for t. So 1 equals 10 e to the ln of 1 half over 24,100 t, and we're solving for t. So we can divide by 10 on both sides. This gives us e to the ln of 1 half over 24,100 t. Can take the natural log of both sides, so ln of one half or one tenth equals ln of one half over twenty four thousand one hundred t, and now we just solve for t. So that means t is equal to twenty four thousand one hundred ln of one tenth over ln of one half, and that's our answer. Uh, what is this numerically? Well, if we put it into a calculator, we get 
1.5 years, approximately. So does that answer make sense? Yeah, because we said it should be greater than 72,300. So we've done something correctly here, and in fact we've done the entire question correctly, which is really nice. So perhaps you're wondering that, okay, um, we use the same equation, we use the CE to the KT, which is used for both growth and decay, but we needed K to be less than zero. Like, did we ever account for that? Well, it's kind of accounted for us. We can see that K is equal to ln of one half over 24,100. ln of one half is a negative number. So we know that K in this case is negative. But where did this ln of one half come from? Well, we can see that it came, this is the one half, and that came from five divided by 10. And in our case, C is equal to 10. So this value of K depends on the natural log of a secondary point in time, right? This is our second observation after time has passed and that divided by c. In this case, we saw that c was equal to how many grams we had at time t equals zero. So really, if we were to write this kind of off to the side, we have k is like proportional to the natural log of some y value initially and some y value at time I, where I is greater than zero. And we know that since we're working with decay, YI will be less than Y zero, or Y naught, which means YI divided by Y naught is less than one, and the natural log of something less than one is going to be a negative number. So you don't really need to know all of this. I just think it's helpful to understand where those things are coming from because one of the things we specified here is, depending on the value of k, we're dealing with either growth or decay. So this is why we didn't really take any extra steps to manage what k is. It's already taken care of for us. Let's do this one. So scientists are examining a pack of wolves in the wild. After the second day of experimentation, there are 100 wolves. And after four days, there are 300 wolves approximately how many wolves were in the initial population. So in this case, we're dealing with growth because we go from 100 to 300. So we'll use the same equation, y equals ce to the kt. We'll let y equal the population of wolves. That is a tough word to say. And t is still going to be our time. And then y of t is the population at time t. So let's just say that, you know, the second day of experimentation, we'll call that t equals two. So that means y of two equals 100, y of four equals 300. And what are we trying to solve for? How many wolves were in the original population? So y of zero equals some question mark. Do we have any idea of what y of zero should be? Like with plutonium, we could kind of predict that, oh, it should be greater than 72,000. But we can't really do the same thing here because we're not given information about half-lives and we don't know how this is growing necessarily. The only thing we expect is for y of zero to be less than 100 because we expect there to be growth. So we want growth from zero, uh, time zero to time two. So if our answer is greater than 100, we probably made a mistake. If it's less than 100, then we're probably good. That's the thing I really like about these problems, is you have a gauge of what your answer should look like. Okay, so let's, let's plug these two into our equation here and see what we get. So we have y, which actually is 100 in the first example, equals ce to the 2k, and we have 300 equals ce to the 4k. Two equations, two unknowns. How are we going to solve for this? 
Well, what we can do is we can solve for c and each individually. So c equals 100 divided by e to the 2k here. And here we have c equals 300 divided by e to the 4k. And then we can set the two equal to each other. And we're left with um, 100 over e to the 2k equals 300 divided by e to the 4k. Cross multiply. 100 e to the 4k equals 300 e to the 2k. Divide both sides by 100. That gets rid of this 100 and we're left with the 3 here. And then divide both sides by e to the 2k. So I'll get rid of this on the right hand side. This is e to the 2k. And then it's the same base. You know, we have e on both for both bases. So we subtract the exponents and we're left with e to the 2k equals 3. So we can solve for k, uh, take the natural log of both sides, uh, ln of e to the 2k equals ln of 3, which means uh, 2k equals ln of 3, and k equals ln of 3 divided by 2. So that's our first uh, constant. Now we should probably solve for c. Uh, so how are we going to do that? Let's just use this equation here and plug in k equals ln of 3 over 2. So c equals 100 divided by e to the 2 times ln of 3 over 2, which is equal to 100 over e to the ln of 3, which is equal to 100 over 3. Cool. So now our growth equation can be modeled as y equals 100 over 3 times e to the ln of 3 over 2 times t. So that's our equation. What are we trying to solve for? y of 0. So where we see a t in here, we put 0. And we get 100 divided by 3 times e to the ln of 3 over 2 times 0. That's equal to 100 over 3 times e to the 0, which is equal to 100 over 3. So we expect approximately 33 wolves to start in the population. That matches our expectation of having less than 100, so that's good. So yeah, there's another example using that same equation, um, this time with growth. Here we go. This is... This is probably one of my favorite kind of applications because um, I've done a lot of other studies in differential equations with uh, heating and cooling. So this one hits home personally. So let y represent the temperature of an object in a room. The room is kept at a constant temperature of 60 degrees. The object cools from 100 degrees to 90 degrees in 10 minutes. How much longer will it take for the temperature to decrease to 80 degrees? And we're going to use this differential equation here, which is called Newton's law of cooling, where M is the surrounding temperature and T is the object's temperature. Okay, so we, we know that M is 60, so we can cross that out and write 60. So what would be a good first step? Let's try solving the differential equation with m equals 60 and see what kind of equation we get. So we have uh, d capital T dt, so I'll just call that dt dt, equals k times t minus 60. Do separation of variables. So dt equals k t minus 60 dt and we want this t minus 60 on the other side. So 1 over t minus 60 dt equals k dt. Let's take the integral of both sides. The integral of the left-hand side, we can use some u substitution. And if you do that, you'll get the natural log of t minus 60. And on the right-hand side, we have kt. And we'll throw in the plus c. Okay, we can take e of both sides. So we get e to the ln of t minus 60 equals e to the kt plus c. Okay, uh, what else can we do from here? Well, the e and the ln cancel, we get, so we get t minus 60 equals 
Uh, if we remember from before, we can rewrite this as c e to the k t. And finally, t equals uh, c e to the k t plus 60. Cool. So we've modeled the temperature uh, in terms of time, which is really nice. So what can we do from here? Well, we're given that the temperature starts at 100 degrees and after 10 minutes, it's at 90 degrees. So this seems like some good initial conditions. Um, so let's just write this out. Let me use a different color. We know T equals 100 at T equals, we'll call it zero, and T equals 90 at T equals 10. So with that in mind, let's try to solve for our constant c and k. So we have 100 equals c e to the k times 0 plus 60, which means 100 equals c plus 60, which means that c equals 40. All right, great. So now let's use the second initial condition with c equals 40 and this equation to see if we can solve for k. So we have 90 equals 40e to the k times t is now 10 plus 60. Okay, so that tells us 40e to the k times, or I'll just write it as 10k, e to the 10k equals 30. e to the 10k equals 30 divided by 40 is 3 fourths. Take the natural log of both sides, get 10k equals ln of 3 fourths and then divide both sides by 10, and that's our value of k. I'm going to need an extra page, maybe. So our equation now is t equals 40e to the ln of 3 over 4 divided by 10 times t plus 60. That is our equation. And what are we trying to solve for? We want to know what is t such that, uh, all right, let me, let me rephrase this. We're trying to solve for what is the lowercase t that makes capital T equal 80. Well, why don't we solve for that? We'll just put 80 in for capital T and solve for lowercase t. That seems like a good plan. So we have 80 equals 40e to the ln of 3 over 4 over 10 times t plus 60. Okay, so that tells us 40e to the ln of 3 over 4t divided by 10 equals 20. Divide both sides by 40, get rid of that here. 20 divided by 40 is a half. Take the natural log of both sides. So we get ln of 3 over 4t over 10 because the ln and the e cancels. On the right hand side, we get ln of a half. And now we solve for t. t equals 10 times ln of 1 half all over ln of 3 fourths. And that gives us, let me check, this should be 24.094. And what's our units? Minutes. And you might be really tempted to stop there because we've just done so much work and you want to call it a day. But unfortunately, this is not the correct answer because the question asks, how much longer will it take? For the temperature to decrease to 80 degrees. So we know, we know at t equals 24.094, we have t equals 80, but the object has cooled to 90 degrees and it's already been 10 minutes. So we need to calculate t equals 24.094 minus 10, because those 10 minutes have already passed, equals 14.094, and we would write, it will take 14.094 
more minutes for the object to cool to 80 degrees. And that's our answer. Now, the question to ask is, does this make sense? We, we sort of went into this question without making any uh, predictions of what our answer should look like. But let's think about it in the real world. If you put an extremely hot item, in this case 100 degrees, into a room that's cooler than it, intuitively, it'll start cooling very quickly. Like, initially, it'll cool very quickly. And then as it approaches the temperature of the room, it'll cool a little bit slower, right? It doesn't make too much sense for it to take a long time to start cooling down and then cool faster as time passes. No, we expect it to start cooling really quickly. So here, it dropped 10 degrees in 10 minutes, but it took another 14 minutes to drop another 10 degrees. So the second stage of dropping a, a second 10 degrees took longer than our first drop, which makes sense intuitively, so our answer is probably right. And that's actually going to conclude our first uh, section on uh, growth and decay. In the next video, we'll study growth a little bit more in something that we call logistical growth. And that will sort of bound how far we can grow. So that'll be even a better model of some of our population growths. Uh, so stay tuned for that video. And I hope you enjoyed this one. So until next time, take care.